digging in and never giving up on the eve of the anniversary of Russia's invasion, an eyewitness report from Ukraine's front line. In the trenches of Bakhmut, in the tanks defending their homeland, Emma hears from those who are giving everything they've got and of the pain of the families who've lost the most. How difficult has this year been? Uh, it's the most difficult year of our lives. We left behind our homes, our kids and our elderly parents. A year ago tonight, the world was about to change in ways violent and profound, scattering refugees across Europe. The UN has just held a vote calling for Russia to leave Ukraine. We'll assess where the war is leading us with James in Kyiv. Also on News at 10 tonight. The Omar police officer fighting for his life. Three are arrested. A community is in deepest shock. Some kids were extremely shocked and traumatized and they couldn't even be at school this morning. One of the biggest issues is that some of them cannot comprehend why it happened. Starmer's five missions for a Labour government, possible or impossible, Anushka assesses. Radford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! The voice of football, who was pitch perfect, tributes to John Motson, who's died at 77, and... The gorillas in the room, Damon Alban, tells Rishi he believes the band can live on, but AI is not the answer. Handing it on to the next generation, or to not to a computer. I think that'd be really nice. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. There is tension and trepidation in Ukraine again this evening, just as there was one year ago tonight ahead of Russia's invasion. President Putin is famous for, among many other things, his addiction to anniversaries. The trepidation is about how he will mark this one. A recent increase in Russian aerial reconnaissance missions suggests something big is coming. Ukraine's President Zelensky remains as resolute now as he was last February. We have overcome many ordeals and we will prevail, he said today. It is already just gone midnight in Kyiv. The 24th of February, the date from which so much death has followed, has just begun, the day Europe woke up to war on its eastern edge. One year on, that war is now largely confined to the southeast of the country where Russia has made its biggest gains. Our correspondent Emma Murphy, cameraman Sean Swan and producer Lutfi Abu Aoun have been to Bakhmut on the front line where they witnessed how a year of war has claimed many lives but not the courage of Ukraine's soldiers. It's a war that was expected to end in defeat within days. A year on, Ukraine is still very much in this fight. The longest battle in this year of brutality is now being waged on the Eastern Front. At Bakhmut, we met with the artillery teams in daily battle with their Russian neighbors. So this is your bunker? Yes, uh, we, uh, this, uh, we here sleep and uh, it uh, work, mm -hmm. it work. From below ground, they track above. Old enmities fought with modern equipment. This is a war where drones are friend and enemy. The shells they guide are from this Soviet self-propelled gun. It was seized from the Russians in previous battles and is now used against them. Their fatigues are British. This is a war sustained by Western support. <laughs> As targets are hit, there's no hiding the hatred, nor sense of small victory. After a year of battle, the ambush of land and life takes a toll. How difficult has this year been? Uh, it's the most difficult year of our lives. We left behind our homes, our kids and our elderly parents. We are constantly on the front line. It's physically difficult. Emotionally, it's even harder. Huh. 
This is not a battle just fought at distance. There is daily close contact fighting to push the Russian front back even a few meters. It comes at great cost. On these streets, life and death are determined in seconds. There's no protection even for those ferrying casualties. However solid the armor, there is only so much protection. But the front line runs for miles and troops must move along it. They do so at speed, aware they're constantly at risk from attack. For the fighters, these are not foreign fields. They are the fields of home. The Russians are a kilometer away and closing in. They seek to repel them with American mortars. The angle of the barrel, a telltale sign of just how close their enemy is. They retreat in case of counterattack and then prepare to refire. They're firing these mortars off in quick succession, but they have a real issue with supply and demand. They're not getting enough through because there's delays in the supply lines and their plea to the world is we want more. For these soldiers, the prize is their land. The price is their lives. Much of their protection is from Western weaponry. American mortar gun M224. Very great play, uh, things in our ammunition. And uh, we use it to shoot uh, enemies uh, from one to three kilometers. Over there? Over there, on the, in the front line. Were you always a soldier? No, no. Before the war, I was a manager in a uh, company which. Uh, sell some things in Amazon and uh, not a lot of... Uh, I'm not a soldier in uh, previous my life. You are now. I, I'm, but now I'm a soldier. I'm a commander. I have a team and we try to uh, do some good in this war. Many of those to whom this area was home are either dead beneath their land or in flight far from it. But some have held on, no fight or flight left. At 83, Alexander Kushlenko was evacuated from Bakhmut when his wife was injured. He's no idea where she is now and is living in a shelter on the front line. I don't want to leave. Maybe they will liberate soon and I can go home. But maybe in the end everything will be destroyed. Across Ukraine, soldiers who pledge themselves to defend this land go to their graves in their thousands. Their battle's at an end. They will never know who was the victor in the war that they gave their lives for. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Eastern Ukraine. Well, this evening at the United Nations, in a vote full of symbolism but very little force, the General Assembly of all member countries called for Russia to pull out its troops. President Zelensky said this week he believes Ukraine can win the war this year. Our own Defence Secretary Ben Wallace said today he expected it would be at least another year, suggesting this first anniversary may not be the last. The sudden unprovoked aggressive invasion of a democratic country, the attempt to conquer and subjugate by force those who wouldn't buckle to your will. And in Europe, the continent where the two worst wars in human history were supposed to have taught us better. By the time the Ukrainians went to bed on the 23rd, the world knew it was coming. American intelligence had predicted it almost to the day. Kiev was anxious not to provoke, but was quietly prepared and equally quietly confident they'd survived the onslaught. Did you know that Russia would fight so badly? We know. Why? Because uh, we were surprised concerning the, first of all, mistake. Mistakes of Russian Federation concerning the um, assessment of uh, Ukrainian armed forces. So on that night of February the 24th, you were confident that Ukraine was going to be able to resist this invasion? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was... Not surprised that we, in that period of time we stopped the movement of 
offensive operations of, uh, of Russian Federation in many directions. If the Ukrainians weren't surprised, Russia's oligarchs certainly were. Hauled in the morning it happened to be told support the invasion or else. This was truly Putin's war. A year later and hundreds of thousands are dead. This, all of this, is Ukraine's wall of heroes, its remembrance of its war dead. New names and photographs are being added every single day. Such are Russian casualties that if they ever set up something similar in Moscow, it would run for several city blocks. And for what? For what have cities like Mariupol been razed to the ground, its population dead or displaced, many of its children forcibly removed to Russia? For what have suburban towns like Borodyanka been gutted, families bereaved, forced from their homes, often forced from their country? A war so pointless and so doomed to fail that Ukraine's national security adviser confidently believes it will end with the destruction not of Ukraine but of Russia itself. The West does not understand the way things are. The process of disintegration of the Russian Federation has already been put in motion and no negotiations or compromises will stop it. It is impossible. You couldn't stop the earthquake in Turkey. It is impossible. The earthquake in Russia has already begun. In one of the most surreal moments of this whole sickening war, the authorities in Moscow tonight mark the anniversary with fireworks. 200,000 casualties on their own side alone, in a war of their own choosing, apparently something to celebrate. Elsewhere, as here in Trafalgar Square tonight, okay. the tragedy of Ukraine was a moment for solemn vigil and visible expressions of solidarity with its victims. And James is in Kiev. I mean, just astonishing images from Moscow in your report there, James. We've had that symbolic vote at the UN tonight, but in the end, it makes the route to the end of this conflict no clearer. Uh, no, because it is, as you say, symbolic. Big majority in the UN General Assembly. The good news is that uh, Russia can't veto it. The bad news is that it's not binding on them. And also that they had a similar vote a year ago, at which 141 v countries voted to demand Russia uh, leave Ukraine's borders. Tonight, 141. So uh, throughout a, a year of hundreds of thousands of casualties, unprovoked aggression, massive disruption to the world's food and energy supplies, international opinion has not shifted one jot. China, India, South Africa uh, still abstaining. You know, it was at this time exactly a year ago, it's after midnight here in Kiev, and it was clear to us then uh, that the attack was coming. And I remember thinking, well, this is going to change the world. And in many ways, it did change the world. But also, I mean, after tonight and with the war stuck in stalemate, you do really begin to wonder how much has changed and he, when, whether anything much more is going to change before we get to the second anniversary of this war in a year's time. Indeed, James, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, for anyone who doesn't remember the troubles in Northern Ireland in those desperate times before the peace process, the shooting last night of a senior detective was the worst kind of reminder of the mentality, the inhumanity of Republican gangsters with a terrorist agenda. Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell was shot several times by two men as he and his young son loaded footballs into the back of his car. He managed to run a short distance. When he eventually fell, the gunmen kept firing. The police have used many words to describe this attack. Brazen, callous, reckless. After two masked gunmen chose a car park full of children to shoot a police officer multiple times in front of his son. Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell remains critically ill in hospital. He is a high profile officer. This afternoon detectives from the major investigation team. Who's fronted many high profile investigations but he was off duty last night when he was targeted. John was finishing up from coaching an under-15s football team. He was accompanied by his young son um, and, in fact, putting footballs into the, the boot of his car. Uh, when two gunmen appeared, fired multiple shots, John ran a short 
distance and as he fell to the ground the gunmen continued to fire shots at him. At this time there were many other young pe uh, people, children, awaiting pickup by their parents and those children ran for cover in sheer terror towards the, the centre. Police say the dissident Republican group, the new IRA, is the main focus of their investigation. This town has been targeted before. A quarter of a century since the Omer bombing killed 29 people, including from the local high school, teachers are once again supporting pupils who witnessed the attack. They were very upset, they were crying this morning. Some kids were extremely shocked and traumatised and they couldn't even be at school this morning. One of the biggest issues is that some of them cannot comprehend why it happened. But attacks by the so-called new IRA have become increasingly common. It claimed responsibility for a car bomb in Londonderry in 2019 and has more recently targeted police officers, attempting to bomb a police patrol last November just 20 miles from last night's shooting. It's been condemned right across Northern Ireland's political divide. The people who perpetrated this evil deed uh, have no support across the entire community in Northern Ireland. These actions are totally intolerable and not acceptable to anybody. Um, I think that they represent an attack on the peace process and everything that we've achieved over the last 25 years. Police haven't commented on the motive, but John Caldwell had been involved in investigating dissident Republican groups, including over the murder of another police officer just a couple of miles from here in 2011. 25 years from the Good Friday Agreement, it's a reminder that policing here remains a dangerous job. But as detectives continue to question three men they arrested earlier today, this community stands defiant. Its thoughts with the officer fighting for his life. Ben Chapman, News at 10, OMA. There's clearly been some political research which suggests five is a good number of policies to lay before the public. At the start of January, the Prime Minister made his five pledges. Well, today, Sir Keir Starmer, sleeves rolled up, set out Labour's five missions for Britain if he replaces Rishi Sunak. They include economic growth, clean energy, the NHS, safety on the streets and changes to childcare and education. At the co-op's iconic headquarters in Manchester, Labour's manifesto began to take shape today, where the short-termism of politics was Keir Starmer's main target. A sticking plaster, never a cure. His answer? Mission-driven government. Five missions, to be exact. And who could disagree? Starmer wants to build an NHS fit for the future, make the streets safer, raise standards for kids, push clean energy. And on the economy? By the end of Labour's first term, we will deliver the highest sustained growth in the G7. Ambitious, but all quite long term. And to win an election, you have to persuade voters that this will change their lives immediately. I don't accept the sort of basic proposition that um, the electorate will simply say, fix my bills for this year and I'm not interested in anything else. What is government for just to keep fixing the problems and end up in five years in the same place where you started, then another five and then another five? Labour is ahead in the polls, but there's still a mountain to climb for a safe majority. Starmer needs to target 150 extra seats, according to the Fabian Society, 25 in Scotland, 15 in Wales, 39 across southern and eastern England. But with 24 in the Midlands and 47 in the north of England, he must also win back his party's former heartlands. Constituencies like Lee in the northwest, not far from where Starmer delivered his speech, that changed hands in 2019 after being Labour for almost 100 years. Uh, I voted uh, Conservative. For the first time? Yeah, for the first time. But are voters here, like Andrew Twentyman, who owns a pizza restaurant, reflecting on that decision? You know Lee. How do you think it will vote in the next election? It will definitely swing Labour. Definitely. The majority wasn't big enough to retain the people who've made a decision and feel like they've been let down. Customer Michelle Codling agrees, saying 2019 was a Brexit protest vote. I just think it's a Labour area, so it'll just go back to Labour now as the Brexit threat's gone. But outside, some unconvinced by Starmer's mission-driven government. Sounds impressive and it seems to come over very well. But I think if he got he, if he if he got in, he wouldn't be able to cope with it, I don't think. 
The Conservatives insisted Rishi Sunak's five pledges had more substance and accused Keir Starmer of failing to deliver. He's never made a pledge that he intends to keep. He's uh, changed his mind on everything from a second EU referendum through to a private sector involvement in the NHS. Plenty of applause in Manchester, so but will the reception be as warm from voters? Anoush Kristan in News at 10. Well, immigration wasn't on Sir Keir Starmer's mission statements. It was, incidentally, on Rishi Sunak six weeks ago. And, of course, the Prime Minister knew what was coming in today's asylum figures. The backlog of people waiting for their claim to be dealt with has reached 160,000, a record. Hence, the announcement of a plan to cut down on the claimants put up in hotels at taxpayers' expense. It involves scrapping asylum application interviews for 12,000 people from Afghanistan, Syria, Eritrea, Libya and Yemen. For the last three years, Wan has been waiting to find out if she can stay in the UK. She fled domestic abuse in Malaysia and is desperate to provide for her young son. But a huge backlog in asylum claims means she's stuck, shut all between hotels and temporary accommodation with no place to call home. We want to improve our life uh, by contribute to the country like uh, work. So not coming here to be put in the hotel and stuck like two, three, four years with, without doing anything. What impact has that had on you personally and emotionally? You feel like suffocate in the situation. The Home Office has been beset by processing delays. The Prime Minister has vowed to stop the boats and cut the backlog. But the longer a decision takes, the more people end up living in hotels, costing millions every day. We will triple the productivity of our caseworkers and we expect to abolish the backlog of initial asylum decisions by the end of next year. More than 70,000 people applied for asylum in the UK last year, the highest number for a decade, while the backlog of those waiting for an initial decision is now at a record high. The government plans to fast-track claims for around 12,000 asylum seekers if they're from these five countries, Afghanistan, Syria, Eritrea, Libya or Yemen. That will include some of those who have arrived on small boats. Those eligible will fill out a 10-page questionnaire instead of a face-to-face -face interview, a plan that's been criticised by some backbench Tories. The quicker you fast-track asylum, the more people will come. So what we want is good asylum decisions. There's no point doing it in the wrong way. Do it well, do it properly, have people who are skilled and properly paid and properly resourced. While charities welcome any move to clear the backlog, they're concerned that claimants will only have 20 days to return the forms in English. People who are being asked to do something so important in a foreign language, these are life and death decisions that the Home Office is looking to make. You do a lot more preparation for a job interview than you would for something that's so important for people that it just seems very unjust and unfair. The Home Office, though, insists this will streamline the system and it's not an asylum amnesty. For some, the process will be quicker, but for tens of thousands of others like Wan, who aren't from those eligible countries, the long wait goes on. Sarah Corker, News at 10, in Leeds. A much imitated, always admired, never bettered, John Motson's voice captured in spontaneous but crafted commentary most of football's fabulous moments. Now, sadly, at the age of 77, he has died. He had the knowledge of a football encyclopedia, the winter wardrobe of Del Boy Trotter, and the enthusiasm of a true fan, which is why so many of them related to him. And it is why generations of the great wide family of football came together today to remember member Motti the maestro. Five, here in the that coat, that voice, both unmistakable, whatever the weather or the gods of football threw his way. But I hope it's a bit warmer. In the FA Cup mud 50 years ago, they smiled on John Motson. Radford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! And so a catchphrase was born and a young commentator's career kick-started. The crazy gang have beaten the culture club. He seemed always to have a phrase ready-made to match the moment. Owen! Oh, this is getting better and better and better! 
Well, what I can tell those people that never got to meet him but felt they knew him is that the John Watson they heard was the real John Watson. There was no front. All that enthusiasm, all that passion for the game, all that authority that he brought to his work, that was real. That was John. The 93rd minute at Old Trafford. So many highs. Yes! So many lows. Oh, dear me. He's going to be out of the final if England get there. And so much controversy. It's Zidane's oh. head into the chest of Matarazzi. That's what it is. But as he later reflected, only the horror of Hillsborough left him struggling for the right words. Memories of that dreadful day when I was, as you say, in the commentary box, unable from where I was sitting to really convey the true extent of the tragedy. They do have a fantastic noise coming from the left-hand end here. From his seat in the stands, he commentated on two and a half thousand games. You are the eyes and the ears of the viewer. For each, the meticulous preparation of a self-confessed soccer obsessive. You know, if I wasn't commentating on a Saturday or a Sunday, I don't quite know what else I'd be doing. He was the voice of football on television. Even today, talking to other commentators who were feeling the sense of loss within the profession, Almost all of them had a helping hand from John somewhere along the line. My way of doing it, which is entirely... As one former colleague said today, every young commentator aspires to a little bit of Motti's style. 50 years of captivating commentary from John Motson, who's died at the age of 77. Now, if it hasn't happened already, it will soon. Rock music produced by artificial intelligence with augmented reality videos. Damon Alban and his virtual band Gorillaz are already halfway there with their computer-generated personas. So who needs singers and songwriters? But as Gorillaz prepare for the release of their new album tomorrow, they told us AI lacks the soul of a human artist. Their creations adored more than their faces seen. The duo behind Gorillaz let the animated characters take centre stage. The pioneering digital band has millions of real fans who admire innovation and expect no less from their eighth album, Cracker Island. We didn't come up with a formula and then we stuck to it for 20 years. It's constantly evolving because he evolves as a musician and I'm evolving as an artist. Los Angeles is really important in the sort of the narrative of this record because the cartoon cipher is deep in sort of the hills of Hollywood and it's uh, the band have now joined a cult. Damon and Jamie have always carefully balanced handcrafted music and illustration with the endless technological possibilities. However, they don't see themselves relying on artificial intelligence. There's a key element missing, which is the soul of the artist. It's a computer attempting to mimic what we tell it. Rarely do sort of true artistic minds have the patience to be that technical. If one is found, then maybe this will be yeah. the, the Michelangelo of, yeah. of the digital age. More than 20 years since the gorilla's journey began, Damon and Jamie are looking to the future. Do you think there's ever a world where you're able to hand Gorillas completely over to... Well, Vicente, we've talked about this a lot, really. I mean, we like the idea. Handing it on to the next generation, well, to not some... to a computer. No, no, to, to people, yeah to, yeah, yeah, to artists and musicians at some point and just allowing it to go somewhere completely different. I think that'd be really nice. Artists often strive for a space where they can be themselves. With their new music, Damon and Jamie continue to make their mark doing the complete opposite. Rishi Davda, News at 10. Back now to tomorrow's first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. When President Putin ordered that invasion, he miscalculated. He believed the West would not come to Ukraine's aid. Well, tonight, in a continuing show of solidarity, international landmarks have been lit up in Ukrainian colours. That solidarity is as strong as at any time since those Russian tanks rolled across the border. In a largely dark capital tonight, there is, of course, a sense of foreboding of what is yet to come, but also a determination that having got this far, they may yet succeed. We'll have more from Ukraine tomorrow, but for now, from all of us here, good night.